All right, I think we'll get started here. Welcome, good morning. I'm Matt Schwegler with the Infrared Training Center. Thanks for joining us for today's tutorial on the <laughs> basics of optical gas imaging. And we'll have Ron Lucier on with us during today's presentation. Ron will join us here in a moment. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items for those of you that are just logging in. As I just heard a moment ago there, we are recording today's session. I will have the recording of this posted later today on our YouTube channel. You can go to youtube.com slash infrared training to view this and several of the other webinars that we've been running here the last couple of weeks. Uh, you'll also find other tutorials on FLIR software and other types of training segments all there at youtube.com slash infrared training. Uh, we're very active, I should say, on social media and you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Instagram as well for updates on upcoming webinars, uh, special training offers, whole lot more. Give us a like, give us a follow. We'll be doing a number of these events throughout the month of April and possibly beyond. Uh, so check back here for updates on what new topics will be coming up here in the coming weeks. When we eventually do return to live training, our complete schedule is available for the US and Canada at infraredtraining.com slash schedule. You'll find a list of classes there for the US and Canada. And for our fellow thermographers based in Europe, the Middle East or Africa, IRtraining.eu is where you can go for the latest information on training courses in your region. I should also mention here uh, for the US, if you're joining us here from the US, we are developing an online level one thermography certification course. Uh, this will be de debuting here with a soft launch later this month and then being expanded into May and beyond. Uh, we'll also roll this out in Canada eventually if you want to learn more, send us an email at info at infraredtraining.com. If you want to get on the list to perhaps join us for one of these classes, but this is the complete level one certification for the first time ever being offered online. Again, rolling that out here later into May, but a soft launch coming later this month. I should mention too, for our live training classes, we're running a special E6 XT total training package right now. This is an add-on uh, package that you can get if you register for a training class. You can also add in a uh, FLIR camera, the E6, as well as a one-year subscription to the FLIR Thermal Studio Pro software. Uh, it's a great deal to get you everything you need to get started with training. And you can also inquire about that uh, via email as well. All right, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, with us today here is uh, Ron Lucier. Ron is one of our senior, senior instructors. He's also our OGI expert and he runs our optical gas imaging classes. And, uh, Appreciate Ron being here today because he's going to talk about the basics of optical gas imaging. Uh, good morning, Ron. How are you? Good morning, Matt, and good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well and safe. Uh, today, we just want to give you a little uh, overview of optical gas imaging and fugitive emissions uh, testing. Uh, this has always become, you know, it's become quite a a science. Uh, going back about 15 years ago, uh, 2005, uh, we uh, created a handheld portable uh, camera that could uh, actually see methane, ethane, uh, propane, and it was revolutionary at the time. And uh, as we were rolling that out, uh, we were asked to put together a optical gas imaging class, not only uh, how to operate the camera, but uh, how to find gas leaks. And that was quite a challenge because uh, none of us had ever done that before. And so we all learned together. And so the result of that is uh, 15 years of doing classes. So uh, we think we've got a pretty good uh, handle on this. And, and something that's not in this presentation, um, uh, ISO, ISO is in the process of writing a standard for optical gas imaging. I'm authoring that. And that'll be 18436-9. Uh, it has not even be submitted as a draft uh, yet. Uh, so in the next, uh, I'd say year or two, uh, take a, maybe a little bit longer, uh, we'll take a look at that. We'll have an international standard on uh, optical gas imaging. Uh, so with that, what we want to cover today is just a little bit of the basic concept of OGI and fugitive emissions. Uh, some companies, uh, some countries call it OGI, some call it fugitive emissions. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the FLIR camera capabilities in gas detection, uh, review some applications that look a little bit towards some future developments. And there's always new stuff happening in this industry. Uh, what is it? OGI is... Uh, Optical gas imaging, that's where handheld or fixed mounted cameras are dedicated to the purpose of detecting leaks of certain gases. Now, we cannot see these gases optically. Uh, it takes a 
very sensitive, highly specialized camera uh, to see that. And the main advantage of the OGI camera is portability, usability, and sensitivity in a broad range of uh, detectable gases, and uh, primarily hydrocarbons. And what we see here is the GFX uh, 320. And <clears throat> the other big advantage of this is we can do everything from a standoff distance. So uh, it's important to, to remember always uh, whether you have a uh, the smallest, uh, simplest IR camera, the value cameras are one of the most expensive. The first purpose of any infrared camera is your personal safety. And make sure that the area you are inspecting is safe. Uh, electrical, mechanical, buildings, uh, wildlife, we always want to make sure that we're, we're very safe. And also have all required permits and uh, look out for each other. Uh, sometimes uh, we're required to go and do these inspections ourselves. Uh, other times we can get some folks to help us, but we all want to look out for each other. And it's way too easy to become complacent and to you know, forget things. Um, we've been advocating for quite a few years uh, to survey uh, from a safe distance, any potentially hazardous areas. And if you start at a large distance, you know, 50, 100 meters or so, uh, and you don't see a large gas cloud, uh, you can cut your distance in half and repeat that process and do it one more time. And what you've done then is you've gotten to the point where uh, you've eliminated the massive leaks, the large leaks, and the medium-sized leaks. And then uh, you'll also know what the direction of the wind is at that point. And so we always want to approach from a, a crosswind or an upwind position, never downwind. So if a large leaks aren't detected, uh, it should be safe to approach with a proper PPE and make sure that you, your PPE is laundered correctly, that you have everything that is required on your permit. Um, all equipment should be inspected for any significant leaks. We, over the years, we found some really surprising leaks in areas where we didn't expect them to be. Uh, there, it's, there's been electrical components, uh, buildings have been leaking gas, um, and even a, a video here, we were doing some training and the inspectors right in the door, they walked in this compressor building, they focus on a nearby small leak and initially missed the larger leak. And the larger leak is in the background. And it's kind of hard here to see this uh, in auto, that's, that's a uh, large gas compressor uh, sitting there. Uh, so we went through the uh, various color modes and then eventually into the high sensitivity mode. Uh, the important thing here is that there was a significant amount of gas in the area. And uh, as they approached with their instruments, uh, they did notice uh, as much as 20% of the lower explosion limit, LEL. Now, this building had been permitted for use, uh, but this is natural gas. It, it rises. It's less dense than air. And the, uh, the person doing the inspection probably uh, missed that area. So it's always a good idea to look around and make sure that your, your area is safe to operate in. Uh, we can also see... Uh, conditions where uh, we're, we're seeing the invisible here. Now, this is an inverted palette. Uh, black has been chosen. Uh, sometimes we, to be hot, so it, sometimes it's easier to see a, a white cloud against, against the back, a black background or a black cloud against the white background. But here, this operator is going up to that hatch. The hatch was open, and I presume uh, that he or she is uh, going to perform uh, tank gauging. Yep tank aging, and that's where they uh, will drop a weight down to the bottom of the tank and measure the volume of the tank. And we can see here uh, that the atmosphere that that person is in. And uh, I'm not quite sure I would do that without a respirator on. <laughs> Uh, so what do these cameras do? Uh, there are a number of cameras that we've developed over the years uh, to detect uh, several gases, but they require a unique camera to do so. Unfortunately, there isn't any way to filter, actively filter these cameras. We haven't figured out a, a way to do that. And uh, we can see we have a, uh, a number of models here, everything from the uncooled GF77 to the uh, cooled uh, GF 300 and 600 series, and they operate at different wavelengths in, within our electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, one of the recent uh, training courses I, I did, uh, they were using a carbon dioxide camera as a trace gas to find uh, hydrogen leaks in generators. So it's not only hydrocarbons that we're able to look at, it's some pretty interesting uh, other gases. This was used as a trace gas. Uh, 
going back to the OGI, uh, in, in 2016, the United States Environmental Protection Agency published an amendment to the regulations, and that really impacted optical gas imaging. It's called Quad OA, and um, it recognized optical gas imaging is the best system for emissions reduction, BSER, and they have a wonderful white paper on this and how they determined it to be the BSER. Um, they also still allow <clears throat> method 21, which is the sniffers, the toxic vapor analyzers, and they're recommended as an alternative to OGI with certain conditions. And Quad OA applies to newly installed compressors, wells, and associated equipment. And it doesn't really apply to the downstream stuff, so they really haven't changed anything in refineries or, or chemical plants. And uh, the EPA statement, uh, the EPA's analysis of the proposed rule found OGI to be more cost effective at detecting fugitive emissions than the traditional protocol for that purpose, Method 21. And the EPA therefore identified OGI as the best system for emissions reduction, uh, emissions monitoring at well sites. And so they did this in, a, uh, in quite an interesting fashion. They took um, several experienced people and several inexperienced people and took them to known sites that had leaks and some that did not have leaks and they asked them to go see what they could find and so they found that they were able to detect uh, more you know potentially reduce more emissions with the optical gas imaging cameras and so this is uh, straight out of the Quad O A uh, for the uh, optical gas imaging. They recommend uh, oil and gas well sites to be done uh, biannual if you do it with OGI and with method 21, if you have a uh, 500 part per million or greater leak, uh, you have to tag that. And uh, for compressor stations, they're recommending quarterly. And the natural gas processing plants, uh, no change from the existing uh, Quad O A, Quad O. And NSPS means new source uh, protection systems, I believe, if you're wondering what, yeah, new source protection systems. Um, anyway, there's a couple of key paragraphs in that document, and they, they really help us, and they really help the users uh, kind of put together a program that makes a lot of sense and is very successful. And it says here, any component that has the potential to emit fugitive emissions of methane or VOC at a well site or compressor station, including but not limited to, and I've highlighted that in red because that's legal talk. That means you're supposed to take a look at everything. And it's very easy to do uh, to look at everything with an, with an OGI camera. We don't have to uh, you know, sniff only the compressors, uh, only the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the valve packing, uh, the packing stuffers or all that stuff. We can look at everything. So if there happened to be a crack in a weld, uh, and I have encountered those in the past, uh, that could be picked up with the OGI. That would be a place that would not normally be um, inspected with other technology. And so to ask you to look at everything, open-ended lines, which would be your relief, uh, pressure relief uh, device vents, uh, instruments, meters, compressors, coverage, everything. So there's uh, quite a list of components to look there. And they do imply that you look at everything. But they do say there are certain things that are supposed to be excluded and uh, level controllers and, and the vents on um, uh, valves, you know, the valve controllers like the air operator or gas operator controllers and pumps, uh, they just normally leak. And so you, those are excluded uh, unless they are blowing continuously. And uh, most companies will report them at that point. Uh, no tagging at the OGI, uh, identified components is required. Now that's an interesting uh, thing, uh, why, why not? Well, it's, it's documented visually. And so a lot of companies will store the image uh, when they do these and keep that for own records, but they do have to identify the leaks. If you're still gonna use method 21, the sniffers, which is a fantastic technology, uh, it, it, it is allowed, but it does require tagging. And everybody that's subject to this rule is supposed to have uh, documented plans. And um, we've, uh, we've helped a bunch of folks try to clarify some of the IR requirements on those plans. Now, there are some general requirements. Um, how often do you, are you going to inspect uh, the, you know, the, the compressor station well sites, the technique you're going to use, uh, identify the manufacturing model of the equipment used, uh, procedures and time fares for re time frames for repairs and um, define the records that are going to be kept for how long. And typically that's for five years. So when a plan is being written, uh, you have an awful lot of documentation. And there are two very important ones here, uh, training and experience of the operator. Uh, in that 
EPA document where they determined was the best system for emissions reduction, uh, they found that, of course, the more experienced operators could find the smallest leaks. And so they want to make sure that everybody is uh, get some training. They don't tell you where to go or how to do it, but that you have to document the training the operation of the operator. And uh, you should have a procedure for calibration and general maintenance. Now, the, the FLIR cameras do not have to be sent in for annual calibration unless you are using the temperature measurement portion of that. And um, that's straight out of our, out of our uh, uh, operator's manual. And um, so we, we the two sections are very, very important. They want assurance that, the, you know, training and qualification, everybody is adequately trained. And uh, just to make sure that you, you don't, uh, are not uh, taking the camera out of the field uh, for too long to get it calibrated. Now, that being said, it's, it's not a bad idea to have these cameras sent in because our service department can pick up any uh, small issues that are, are happening with a camera. So uh, I won't say never send your camera in, but um, it's something to just to consider. So, uh, and we also continue to, uh, to this day to train regulators in industry, and it's been uh, very enlightening to see uh, this, this whole industry from both sides. Again, a calibration maintenance, no temperature measurement, paragraph 3.2 in the GF series operator's manuals. It's been there uh, since we uh, sent out the, uh, the GF camera, I believe in um, 2009. So that is your uh, that your choice as to whether you want to get that camera calibrated. And a couple of other uh, key paragraphs here, and these are, even if you're, you know, from another country and you're not a subject to these regulations here, uh, it's a good idea to follow this process and to do an initial and daily verification check. Well, the initial uh, verification check for our cameras is done by FLIR and uh, we verify that we could see 60 grams per hour, 1% diluted, 50-50 mixture of methane and propane at certain wind velocities. There's a whole big report uh, on that. Be happy to uh, direct you to that. Uh, but this is a the daily verification check. A lot of folks uh, are, have been calling up recently asking, how do we do this? And the EPA tells you exactly how to do this. It's a, uh, a leak of any verifiable leak of any hydrocarbon or gas that your camera is designed to see uh, with at least a 98% purity. You just want to verify that the camera is working. And the most important thing here, and something we really stress in our training, is assuring that there's adequate thermal background. Um, when a gas, compressed gas releases, it drops in temperature, of course, but it also takes on the, um, the temperature of the atmosphere fairly quickly. And therefore, a little ways away from that gas leak, you can assume that that gas is probably at ambient temperature and we need some energy behind that gas in order for the camera to image it. And uh, I think the official number is two degrees C. I've heard five degrees C temperature difference. Uh, I've tested it uh, much lower than that in control conditions, uh, but you have to have an adequate thermal background and a procedures to, to demonstrate that. And also, uh, what are you gonna do in adverse monitoring conditions? Uh, it was raining out here uh, this morning and it would not be the ideal time to go uh, do a regular gas leak, but a gas inspection. But, you know, if it is raining out, these cameras are protected. Uh, you certainly could go do it in kind of like an emergency situation. And also how to deal with max wind speed, the maximum wind speed. Um, we, we've published some charts, uh, speed versus distance versus detectability. That's up on the FLIR.com uh, slash OGI website. And also, how are you going to uh, monitor the uh, or inspect the difficult to monitor components? And uh, one answer to that would be to add a telephoto lens to the camera uh, or choose a camera with a telephoto lens in the case of the GFX cameras. So these are the, the hardest ones, the initial and daily verification check, uh, the thermal background and the max wind speed. So even if you're not subject to the regulations, uh, I would uh, create um, a procedure based on this to make sure that anyone who's using uh, the OGI cameras uh, can have great success in uh, imaging this or, or detecting leaks, okay? And unfortunately, the EPA gave little guidance on how to perform uh, verification checks. There are lots of options that are available. They, they give you a daily an initial check, uh, but uh, the to, to the exact guidance on how to perform these checks is kind of uh, kind of obscure. 
Uh, so here's a, uh, a, what I call a sensitivity check that I did several years ago. And uh, this is just a little uh, propane lab. You can see the bottle, a one pound bottle of propane and an airflow meter there. And uh, that leak is less than five grams per hour. And so we'll see at the very, very end uh, how little there is. And you can see even in the auto, that was in the audio, we could see a little bit of the gas as it moved. And I, if I remember right, this was under um, uh, a overcast day. And so we don't have an awful lot of energy. And that's just a piece of aluminum with some electrical tape on it. It's nothing more than, uh, the, more than that. In the high sensitivity mode at an HSM of uh, uh, seven, uh, we can easily see the leak. But as we decrease that, that sensitivity, uh, the leak is very hard to find. And so here's uh, the little flow meter. You see that little black bead down the bottom there? That was the smallest leak that I could create. And so we're talking about very, very, very low flow. And I calculated about five grams per hour. So uh, if you need to make one of these, uh, that is the part number for the flow meter. Uh, it's a bent piece of aluminum, a lot of brass fittings available at any hardware store. Uh, in total, uh, you'd have $150 in parts and that meter is roughly, I don't know, 90 to $100 if I remember right. And so that could give you a very simple, very portable uh, gas lab. Uh, for our instructors, I've made labs that uh, just fit in a Pelican case. And uh, if anybody needs any instructions on how to do that, I'd be happy to, to give that to you. All right, so gas detection. Uh, if you see that gas leak right there by the yellow arrow, uh, that was actually taken with a long wave camera, not the GF77, and that's methane. They're doing a pipeline purge there. And so methane does have some absorption in the long wave. And we've, of course, uh, we've improved the sensitivity of the camera. We now have a, the long wave cameras as well. They're no, they don't meet the quad OA requirements, uh, but they, they certainly uh, do see gas. So to detect or see a gas, or several conditions have to be correct. Uh, the gas has to absorb infrared energy within the bandwidth of the detector. What does that mean? Our detectors uh, only, we allow them to sense only a small amount of energy. And even though the detector might be able to sense energy from three to five micrometers, uh, we restrict it. And we do that with a filter. And then the camera needs a filter that corresponds to the gas absorption wavelength. So different gases absorb energy at different wavelengths. And uh, in particular with, with hydrocarbons, it's that carbon hydrogen stretch, that CH stretch. It's an oscillation. It's kind of like a resonance, a quantum resonance. And so we look right at that wavelength. And so uh, do we see the gas directly? No, we don't. We see the gas indirectly. We see the gas blocking energy from behind it. And that's the key to all this. And it does it doesn't matter whether it's warm or cold, it's just that it's not at ambient temperature. We have to get uh, you know, some energy for the gas to detect. And then we have to have our adequate background energy. And uh, literally, I've, I've been able to image gases with, this, with less than a half a degree C uh, temperature difference. And uh, the easiest part of this is, is generally cloud motion. You can see the clouds moving. It's fairly simple. So those are our conditions. And we do this uh, literally by, in, at least in the FLIR cameras, we, we put the filter uh, inside our detector and then that is cooled down to uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures, which is uh, minus 196C minus 321 Fahrenheit or 77 Kelvins. And I don't know what it is in rank and nobody's ever asked, uh, but it's a very, very, very cold detector. Uh, so that filter, the purpose of that filter is to allow only a certain amount of energy uh, to get through to the detector. Uh, if you have a radio, an FM radio, uh, at least in the U.S., that receives from 108 megahertz all the way down to 88 megahertz. And uh, within that radio our range, you're at different channels. Uh, whether you want, you know, if it's talk radio, it's... it's um, rock music or country music, whatever kind of music you like, uh, you tune a radio to a specific channel. That's what we're doing here. Um, the detector can sense a whole broad amount of energy and we just choose to, to listen to only the energy that, are, that are, uh, accompanies the, absor the absorption of gas. And so that's the, uh, the secret sauce behind all of these cameras, okay? So here we have a 
graph of propane, a uh, very common gas. You see the gray line here, that is how it is absorbs the energy. So we see on the left-hand side here, uh, the ordinate, the y-axis, uh, down at zero, that means the gas is absorbing 100% of the energy. And if it went up to the top, it would be uh, transmitting, it'd be transparent. And what we do is we put a filter represented by that yellow shape there. Uh, that is the filter uh, that is in the camera, very close to the actual filter we use. And so the energy that's available uh, to be detected uh, by the IR cameras, which in what's in the crosshatch. And so we can see we have an awful lot of energy uh, that's available to the, the camera, and propane is very easy to see. We take another gas like methane. Methane is a very symmetric gas. It's one carbon, uh, four hydrogens, and, and those bonds, the CH stretch, are oscillating. They're twisting, they're translating, they're wobbling. And so we have a, uh, we basically have standing waves there. There's uh, not as much energy available uh, to detect methane. So uh, the, the question that comes up many times is, can I see a smaller propane leak than I can a methane leak? And that answer is yes. Okay, and so we have some other gases, uh, gas called ethylene C2H4, where methane is CH4, we just add one carbon here. Uh, we can see that gas in two different wavelengths. Uh, we can see that way out in the long wave, and that would be the GF306 camera, uh, or we can see that in the mid wave, and that's the GF320, uh, 320, uh, all of that series, 320, 620 camera so there are different wavelengths uh, so just because the gases absorb at one wavelength doesn't mean they wouldn't in another okay and so we can see the absorbed energy there there is you can probably find a smaller leak with a long wave camera of ethylene than you could with a mid wave camera but the but the mid wave cameras they are generic so uh, the 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 midwave camera sees a whole bunch of hydrocarbons, and I, I cannot think of one that we can see within the midwave that we cannot see, uh, excuse me, that we, can, that we can see in the long wave that we cannot see in the midwave. So the midwave is the most useful. Now, the US National Institute of, for Science and Technology, NIST, uh, they have created a chemistry web book that's a resource for hundreds of gases, and that's the URL for that, and that's where I get that data uh, to, to produce these curves. And it's a uh, very interesting data. Now, some applications here. Uh, well, uh, you can do pretty much anything with an OGI camera that you can do with a long wave camera. Right here, we actually see a tank level. And so we can measure temperatures with these cameras. We can um, we do quite a bit of stuff, but it's unique to the gases. Uh, here is a, a valve on top of a tank. Uh, we're going through all of the different color palettes here just to show the, the capabilities of the camera. There are six color palettes. And uh, we also have the high sensitivity mode. At the very bottom of the tank, you can actually see the, the residue, uh, which was a little bit of crude oil. Uh, that was in there, uh, but that valve was leaking and that's something that's not desired. Uh, that's quite a bit of VOC to our atmosphere. Uh, in a compressor building, uh, this is a vertical separator and there is one of the controllers and that particular controller was venting continuously. And while the EPA says we don't have to report uh, controllers, they're exempt from this. I don't think they are, or it's at least a good idea to, to report those that are, that are blowing continuously. And this one here certainly was. Uh, that hot line that you see in front, that's the discharge line from the compressor. And you can see the, uh, the volume of gas that was in this, uh, in this particular area. And so uh, towards the end there, the, the high sensitivity mode was changed from a high number to a low number. We do that when we, when we see a large gas leak and we want to isolate its source. Uh, outdoors, these are wells. And uh, these two wells here uh, were leaking uh, around the base. Uh, we weren't quite sure initially uh, what was going on here, but there's a significant amount of uh, gas leakage uh, that is not allowed, that's not uh, a good idea. And um, in a moment here, we're gonna scan to the right and you can start to see the gases coming out of the ground. And this is kind of a bad thing for the owner of the well. Uh, the casing on those wells was blown. And I believe these wells had to be taken out of service and uh, either replaced or repaired.
That's a very, very, very expensive process. And that's the utility of that high sensitivity mode. The high sensitivity mode is a continuous image subtraction mode. Um, that's the easiest way to uh, explain it, okay? And this is a residential gas leak. We don't have to uh, inspect these areas, but some companies, uh, some municipalities have the OGI cameras and uh, there it's pretty obvious where the gas was coming from was bubbling up through the water. Uh, I didn't need a gas camera to see that, uh, but certainly it visualizes uh, you know, the severity of the situation. You can see the fire truck in the background and that would be something for the, uh, the gas company uh, to, to deal with. Okay, uh, as far as our air goes, uh, this is a uh, cam lock. So this is a gasoline delivery truck and he's at a terminal. Uh, I believe he was filling with gas when, when this was taken. And we can just see the vapors coming off of there. The seals on the cam lock itself were perfect. It was not dripping a, you know, draw, not dripping gasoline, uh, but it certainly was uh, emitting some vapors. So there are a number of companies that have chosen to uh, use this technology to assure the, uh, the integrity of their, of their uh, delivery hoses and trucks. Helpful to the environment. Away from hydrocarbons, uh, this is a large 345,000 volt breaker. And uh, the breaker is filled with a gas called sulfur hexafluoride. And the, the breaker gas does not conduct electricity. And this gas here uh, was a fairly significant leak. Um, and as the thermographer, which was me, would stop moving, you can actually see what's coming out from one bolt. Now it's a very, very, very large breaker. Uh, that's enough power in there to the power a good portion of a city. And uh, this was taken uh, from a remote distance with a telephoto lens. Uh, that's not exactly the type of place you wanna crawl up there uh, with a sniffer, not with that type of voltage. So those are, that's the use of a, of a long wave uh, cooled camera. And a lot of folks are always curious about cows uh, with their four stomachs. Uh, do they burp out methane? Absolutely. That actually was carbon dioxide. Uh, so there's, uh, there's carbon dioxide and um, uh, methane that'll come out of that cow. We need a long wave cow and a very happy cow uh, wagging her tail there. So carbon dioxide has uh, quite a uh, bunch of uses as well. And uh, looking forward, uh, we're always looking for, for different types of technology, different things to do. Uh, what's coming? Well, we already have our uh, GF620 camera and um, in our, in our uh, GFX320 cameras. And those are certified for uh, HasLock uh, class one, hazardous locations, class one and division two, and uh, the ATEX and the IECEX uh, zone two. And every time I show this uh, particular video of the, the drop tests that our uh, engineers in Sweden do, I show that to my classes, uh, they're horrified. Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, anyone to drop a camera that distance, certainly, uh, but that's the type of uh, testing procedures that the cameras go through. And I've known uh, one camera, uh, one student had dropped the camera in class, picked it up, and it worked fine. Uh, after his, then his heart restarted. Uh, anyway, uh, we now have the, uh, the GF77, which is a handheld camera, and the GF77A, which is a fixed mounted camera. They're uh, uncooled and they're more affordable. And those cameras are sensitive to methane, sulfur dioxide, and nitrous oxide uh, for anybody that needs to use those. The, the 77 series is not as sensitive as a cooled camera, uh, but uh, they could be a big uh, benefit in certain industries. <clears throat> We've also partnered with uh, Providence Photonics and we now offer a quantification solution and this is called the QL320 and uh, this is a tablet can be connected to a um, right to the camera you can take it out on the field or we have what's called the Q mode in our cameras which will record uh, the data necessary and it's a little bit of setup a little bit of training but uh, this steps you through uh, the first time I used the can uh, the the QL320 I had no clue what I was doing with within five minutes I had it connected and I was getting good data so it does uh, work very well the green there uh, that's the actual plume and when it's green, it tells you that you have adequate thermal background. So this is a uh, pretty 
pretty well designed uh, device to help us quantify. And that will give you in, uh, you know, quantification of different gases and in many different units like liters per minute or, or pounds per hour, whatever uh, you're interested in. <clears throat> um, it operates live, and really, what we're we're doing here with a with the uh, with a QL320, uh, we in the Q mode at least we store sequences, and a sequence is like taking 15 JPEGs a second uh, in these cameras. And so, if you were to just store one image, uh, that would be that's not enough data to uh, really get an analysis on. Uh, so this uh, the Q mode will will store uh, 15. Uh, JPEGs per second. You, you can always make a video out of that uh, later on. We have different software that does that. And so it's quite a, uh, uh, quite a nice little technology. Uh, we just last week, uh, this is something absolutely brand new uh, to us. Uh, FLIR uh, released the SI-124 sound imaging instrument. And what it is, there are 124 microphones on it and a visual camera is not intrinsically safe. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's used one. I've been begging to get my hands on one. Uh, but as you know, with the current things going on with uh, around the world with a virus, it's tough to get uh, any equipment right now. Uh, but I think this has great potential. We're showing this as a, as a you know, buzzing or uh, the arcing uh, that's up in a switch. It could even be Corona in that switch. I'm not quite sure. But I think this has a possibility for helping uh, folks confirm a, a gas leak. Because it's, it's pretty obvious that taking out a compressor, it's pretty obvious that taking out uh, a pipeline or whatever is extraordinarily expensive. And uh, just to be, make sure that you have uh, identified all the leaks and done so correctly, I think this thing has a, has a place in the future uh, for OGI. So stand by on that one. Uh, we also have uh, the FLIR Thermal Studio, and it is awesome software. The reporting features are very powerful, but the one feature, the mapping, is particularly important to the OGI community. Um, we have, we've been showing FLIR tools, which is also awesome software in the past, but it really didn't do much with the GPS coordinate. Yeah, it would, uh, if you had your GPS on, you could click on it, it would bring you up a map of where you were. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, this, this new software is pretty cool. So if the GPS is enabled and a signal is present, and that's the important thing right there, if a signal is present. Uh, so displaying the GPS coordinates on the front display of your camera is very, very important to, to do this. Uh, it'll show you exactly where you were standing. And a few months ago, I was up at our offices in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, and I just walked around the building and I stored picture after picture after picture after picture after picture, and I batch exported them. And uh, it shows me exactly where I was standing when I took that image. Now, on a large compressor station and a large well site, uh, this has got to be invaluable for folks to prove, yeah, I went there, and yeah, the, this image here goes with that particular component. Uh, the, the map overlay is still under development. Uh, there are a few, a few things that we need to, uh, we requested, I should say, uh, the software developers to add. And uh, so I would also stand by for that. I think this is gonna become an integral part of the OGI uh, courses. So in summary, uh, we're, we regularly conduct regional and on-site OGI classes, and uh, we welcome new users through experts. Uh, it's, it's, we've had some wonderful debates over the years as to uh, some of the capabilities of the camera and some of the uses. Uh, we are not the world experts. Uh, we don't have the subject matter expertise that the folks in the field have. And so, the, so we might know how the camera runs, we might know how the, the, the theory, et cetera, but the actual application, uh, we love to have folks uh, come into class and uh, help discuss uh, that with us. Uh, so you can get some more information specifically on the, on the testing and the verification that we did. It was, we had our cameras independently tested. Um, and the, the, I think it was a National Physical Laboratory in England uh, did all the independent testing. And you can go to fleer.com uh, slash OGI or the uh, www.irtraining.com. And so uh, that's what I have. I thank everyone. And I'll stop sharing here so Matt can come back. Great. Very good. Thank you very much, Ron. Appreciate oh, it. Good my information there. 
I had a couple yeah. questions that came in. If you sure. want to send in a question right now for Ron, we have some time to take those. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'll go over those as part of the, uh, as we wrap up today's uh, presentation. Just to give everybody a minute to send in their questions, just want to briefly recap that we have recorded today's presentation. It'll be available for playback here later today off of our YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com slash infrared training, you'll see this presentation along with several others that are listed there. We have a, a subset playlist uh, called infrared webinars that I'm, I'll put this up in there. And the idea is to do more of these throughout the month of April. So if you want to come back here, follow us on, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Instagram. We'll be announcing other topics for the upcoming weeks. As of right now, uh, we're planning two for next week, one on infrared and its use in the fire service. And the other might be another software presentation because those have been received very well here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Ron had mentioned FLIR Thermal Studio. We actually have two webinars that are available on that topic right now off of our YouTube channel. So we'll have more on that. But if you want to give us a like, give us a follow, we'd love to have you join us. You can keep in touch with, you know, current training offers, special announcements, all sorts of good stuff here on these social channels. And as I said earlier, when we return to live training here, hopefully soon, uh, you can find our complete schedule for the U.S. and Canada at infraredtraining.com. And then for our fellow thermographers that are based in Europe, the Middle East or Africa, irtraining.eu is where you can find a list of courses in those regions. And also our online level one certification class will be making its soft debut here later this month and then rolling out more widely in May, initially here in the US and then plans to expand into Canada. Really excited about this. Uh, it's a great new opportunity for those of you that wanna get training, get certified, but you don't wanna have to travel. And uh, it's the whole course, the whole course, all four days are gonna be online. This new online level one thermography certification. If you wanna be informed about possible uh, the dates and all that, you can go to infrared, or sorry, excuse me, info at infraredtraining.com, uh, email our office and we'll get back to you with the details on that. All right, I'll leave that up there for a moment while I take some questions here for Ron. It's several that came in. Uh, but I want to back up actually to one. Let me unshare for a moment. Because I promised David I would get in touch with him on this question. Let's see. David from earlier, Ron, was asking about what is the NEMA rating for the FLIR cameras and do they vary between models? Yeah, we don't have a NEMA rating on the cameras. There is an intrusion protection rating and it's IP54, which is uh, tested to limited dust intrusion and limited uh, water intrusion, but uh, th there's no NEMA rating. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, Kevin was asking about any SUAS applications for OGI at this point. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's quite a few SUAS applications. Um, the little drone camera, the GF77A, could actually that automation camera could actually be put up on a drone. Uh, if the leak is large enough, I actually have some drone video from just a regular uh, you know infrared camera on a drone. I don't know which model it was but it's not, you're not gonna see the small leaks and there are platforms up there uh, utilizing the G300A and even the GF320 uh, cameras, uh, some larger SUAS platforms. Uh, I think that's probably a, a good subject for another webinar uh, in, the, in the future. And maybe we could have uh, our colleague, Bill Schwann do that because he's our SUAS expert. No, great to hear because Ed was asking about that also, which cameras yep. can be used with a drone, specifically those for fracking operations and whatnot. So hopefully mm -hmm. that helps him with that. Yep. Another question coming in, can we check oil leakage and fumes emitted in oil transformers? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the, um, that that's a mineral oil. I don't know what that vapor is that vapor actually is. And so uh, nobody's actually asked that question before. We've had that you know, question, can we see the nitrogen coming out of a, uh, of a transformer? And that answer is no, we cannot see hydrogen. We can't we see nitrogen or argon or any of the, any of the gases. We need a compound and, and only certain compounds. So as far as a transformer oil, um, other than it making a visual stain, I don't know. Um, might wanna get some, some of that transformer oil and test it though. 
got a question coming from David, and I'm not sure if I'm misreading this, yeah. but maybe help me out. Do the handheld cameras have a built-in LEL alarm for hazardous work areas? No, they don't. Uh, that's why uh, all folks who are doing this are required to have a four gas monitor or an H2S monitor uh, on your on your person when, when uh, you do this. It's just too much. You know, if we were to add everything to the camera, uh, it, it would just increase the cost and be a little unwieldy. And uh, those. Uh, uh, gas monitors, they have to be, I think, bumped or, or, or at least uh, tested once a month or once a week in some facilities. And so it'd be uh, very difficult to do that. But it's a good idea, great idea. Sure. I had a question about the K55 cameras. Are they sensitive enough to detect gas leaks? That's a good question. I don't think so. Uh, even though it is a long wave camera, uh, it's, you know, optimized for use in the fire service. And I, I just not quite sure there'd be sensitivity, sensitive enough there for methane. But I, I, every time I've said no, the camera can't do it, I've been surprised. <laughs> Steven was wondering, can you identify the type of gas that, uh, based on the image data? Any way to do that? There's no way to speciate the gases, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and the EPA does not require us to do that or their uses of these to require it. It's, if it's a VOC, and you see a leak, it's a leak. If you don't see a leak, it's not a leak, according to the EPA. Uh, speciation would require a uh, technology way beyond uh, what we could put in a portable camera. I've got Sasha back on. Looks like uh, wondering, do we have an experience or, or an example with ammonia inspection? Wondering if you have any background. I have uh, a whole bunch of ammonia inspection videos. They look exactly like the uh, the, the, the gas videos, you know, the hydrocarbon videos, and uh, I'd be happy to send some examples. I think we probably have some up on our, on our website for detecting ammonia, in our, you know, like for refrigeration leaks. Ron, let me see, you know what I'll do uh, for anybody who's on with us and would like to contact you? Sure. Should be able to send the chat to everybody, all panels. And I'm gonna put Ron's email address in here. Yep. I wanna email Ron. Uh, Sasha, you can do that. There's his email in the chat, ron.lucier at fleer.com. Yep. You could also do ron.lucier at infratraining.com. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and get in touch with him and he can actually help you out with that. Uh, let's see. I had a question from uh, Jonathan. Uh, where do the T500 series cameras fall in this? Are they capable of gas detection? They would be capable, yes, believe it or not. They're not rated for, but because they have a long wave imager, uh, if it was uh, a large leak of methane, uh, you could use it. But the EPA doesn't recognize uh, that right now. They, they don't meet the sensitivity requirements. Now, the EPA uh, required for all the camera manufacturers to document a leak of 1% diluted, so it's 10,000 parts per million, 1% diluted, 50-50 mixture of methane and propane. And so that's a very, very, very little amount of gas. And uh, our cooled cameras can easily meet that requirement. The, the uncooled cameras, they're just, there's just too much noise on the detector. So uh, to, to use it as a regular scan camera, you know, go in and, and uh, you know, look at compressor stations, et cetera, no. If you had a, a you know, like a large pipeline leak, uh, maybe you could see it. You probably could see it if it was a big leak coming out of the ground. Had a question from Stephen about uh, detecting fumes from a spill. I'm assuming yes, yep. or what is? Yes, yeah. that answer would be yes, absolutely, yep. Uh, it, well, it, well, provided that you, you had the right camera. Okay, so if, if, if it was a hydrocarbon spill, yes. You know, diesel oil, um, I can test that out in the backyard. That's easy to, to do. Not sure if we answered this one, but a question about which camera can help identifying a transformer oil leak. Uh, anything with yeah. that? Yeah, I, I don't know that we have a, a camera that can do that. Other than uh, it's going to be, you know, it's probably going to be wet on the side and there could be a, a, an indication that way if you had a small transformer oil leak. But uh, other than that, I don't think uh, you'd see the vapors. And thank you, Bill. By the way, Bill Schwann, ITC's Bill Schwann is on. He is our SUAS resident expert and instructor. And if you have questions about optical gas imaging and the SUAS applications, you can email Bill Schwann, it's william.schwann at flare.com. And he just uh, chatted that into the uh, field there as well. So another good resource for Bill. Uh, we'll wrap it up with these two questions from Ed. Uh, first off, a capability of the SUAS, uh, the X-T2, uh, anything, and uh, maybe Bill, you could get back to him, but Ron, any 
anything that you know about that? Uh, that, that that's a bill question. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah. Ed, we'll have you, um, we'll put Bill, Bill's email up there on actually, I'll send that out here before we get off. And just one final question uh, from Ed also was wondering about, the, wondering about the price range on the gas detection cameras. Um, it's our sales department has that information. I, I really don't know what the current prices are and I hate to quote somebody and uh, have it be a, a different price. So that's, that's the proper purpose of our sales group. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I can get Ed some yeah. information yeah. Uh, he wants offline. That's fine. Um, that looks like, I think we're good here. Excellent. Let's see. Yeah, I think we'll write. Let's actually, you know, Sasha. One more question: Could, would, would the ultrasound detection device work for an oil leak run? Do you know if it would or not? I don't know. I, I haven't had one in my hands, and this is so brand new. I heard about it a while back uh, that it was coming, and uh, I've asked to, to get one internally, but uh, I haven't seen one yet. And so I'd say, uh, what, give us some time. I think literally they released it last week. Uh, and it's it showed up on our it's up on our website now, but give us a little bit of time um, as soon as we get back uh, traveling, uh, get an opportunity to take that instrument out in the uh, in the field, and we'll gather some data, and we'll probably have a webinar on it. Nope. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I find that fascinating. I would love to learn yeah. more about. I don't know anything about that particular application. Very good. Great. Looks like I, I put Bill's email up for anybody who wants to talk to Bill Schwann, William dot Schwier, uh, William dot Schwann <laughs> at Twitter dot com. And uh, I think that's it, Ron. I think we'll call it a day here. Fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Hope everybody stay safe. Likewise. And thanks for joining us as well. We'll be back next week with more live webcast. Uh, we'll see you online again soon. Until then, have a great weekend. Yep. Bye, folks. <laughs>